Before we get into this episode, a quick message from our sponsor, Perceptix. In our post-pandemic world, designing and delivering an exceptional employee experience has become a business imperative, as we all know. Perceptix can help you get a clear picture of your employee experience with a continuous listening and people analytics platform aligned to your specific business goals. Discover why more than 500 enterprise customers and 30% of the Fortune 100 trust Perceptix to capture employee feedback, supported by insights and prescriptive actions for every level of the organization. Learn more at perceptix.com forward slash future of work and perceptix is spelled P-E-R-C-E-P-T-Y-X.com and again, forward slash future of work. I remember uh, another uh, mentor of mine said, the worst thing you can do in a crisis is hide in your own office because everybody is confused and the leader needs to be out there and actually giving a direction and giving clarity. And so I've always uh, really approached a crisis as an opportunity to engage in a dialogue, to engage in really building the camaraderie and making tough decisions, but with everybody understanding why they're being made. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of The Future of Work. My guest today is Lorenzo Simonelli. He's the chairman and CEO of Baker Hughes. Lorenzo, thank you for joining me today. Great to be with you, Jacob. So to give people a little bit of context on how we connected, uh, I think I was actually sharing something on LinkedIn and I was talking about leadership and somebody in the comments tagged you and they said that you were you know, an amazing leader, that you basically exemplified all the points that I was talking about in there and I thought, oh my goodness, I have got to reach out and interview Lorenzo and so here we are. I think that was a couple months ago now. It was and I'm very grateful for that person that tagged me and uh, clearly the future of work is a very important topic. So looking forward to the conversation today and engaging in the discussion. Yes, likewise. Well, why don't we jump right in and get a little bit of background information um, actually about you and Baker Hughes. So why don't we start with Baker Hughes as a company? Who are you guys? What do you do? How many employees do you guys have? So Baker Hughes as a name is actually a very historic name within the oil and gas industry and uh, is over 100 years old. And it's actually the coming together of uh, Baker Oil Tools and then Hughes. And uh, we merged actually G Oil and Gas in 2017 and created what we define as the new Baker Hughes. And it's really a complement of uh, services and equipment technology around uh, energy. And we've got about 60,000 employees globally in 120 countries. Wow. Obviously, we've gone through all the different cycles that many know of the industry. And uh, at the moment, really focused on energy technology as we go through the energy transition. Yeah. No, I mean, I've been reading a lot about some of the stuff that you guys are doing, and it's been, um, it's been fascinating. Uh, and what about you? How... Uh, how did you actually get to become the CEO of Baker Hughes? I was trying to look up a bunch of stuff about you. I found that your your family is from Tuscany, where I think your father still has a a vineyard where he makes olive oil. That is correct. We still make wine and olive oil in the traditional way in Tuscany and uh, a lot of history. And I came to uh, Baker Hughes really through an aspect of uh, 25 years with GE. So... My background is uh, born in Italy, uh, educated in the UK, and then I joined uh, General Electric and went through the management ranks there. And my last role was actually managing uh, G Oil and Gas, which then we merged with Baker Hughes to form really Baker Hughes in 2017. So um, I took on the role of chairman and CEO in 2017 and have been here since. All right, so let's go back even, even farther. Uh, back when you were, much younger. Did, did you know that you wanted to go into business? Did you know that you wanted to become a CEO? I mean, how do you go from, you know, your your childhood background to becoming the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company? Well, I think it started off with uh, really taking um, a leaf out of uh, my dad's book and he moved away from agriculture and went into banking. So my first element was, okay, I'd like to be in banking. 
And as I started to get exposed to banking and I had a time at Mitsubishi Bank, I started to realize, well, it's great to be able to see these loan documents and syndications come together, but it's even better when you can see what's being produced and how you actually are helping people in their lives yeah. through the technology and the equipment. And so I joined General Electric and I knew from early on coming in from a finance background, I really wanted to run a company. And that's been my desire and uh, very pleased as I've progressed to be able to have that opportunity and lead people and also be able to learn from others. And I think, uh, you know, there's an aspect of uh, continuous uh, managing ambiguity and continuous learning as you become a CEO. So today, obviously, you're responsible for the lives of tens of thousands of employees around the world. Uh, as the CEO of Baker Hughes, can you give us a sense of what a typical day looks like for you? So starting from when you wake up in the morning until when you go to bed, what, what does a day in the life of um, Lorenzo Simonelli look like? Well, the day normally starts out pretty early. I'm um, an early riser and that's because it's my own time and I like to go to the gym and I'll work out early in the morning. Uh, then obviously uh, get into the work day and uh, a variety of different elements with employee roundtables, customer meetings, also spending time with my direct team. I'm fortunate to have uh, a great leadership team at Baker Hughes that helps to uh, take care of the day-to-day -day operational items. And I stay focused very much on the employees, the culture, and also the strategic direction of the company and also managing the board and uh, making sure that all the various stakeholders, including investors, understand where we're taking the company. So lots of, it sounds like meetings, relationships, interactions. You're not very often just like sitting in a room by yourself, pondering about the world. So I think it's always important to have time to think. And I take uh, time to think each day for myself and the reflection of where we're taking the company. Uh, but clearly it's in the mix of also the other meetings that take place. But uh, I think it is important that uh, leaders have time to also go back and reflect upon what they're doing. And how do you end the day? So I'll end the day normally uh, with uh, either a customer dinner or an engagement with customers or actually go home and uh, relax and uh, read and catch up or uh, watch some TV and uh, I'll get my exercise in in the morning, but then the evening I'll try and relax. Hmm. Um, it's been, I think, interesting and I'm curious to hear your take on this. Um, so I interviewed Tim Ryan, who's the CEO of PwC in the United States a little while ago. And I think he's also running around 55,000, uh, 60,000 employees there. And when we talked, one of the things that he told me is getting increasingly challenged for, le uh, for leaders is living and working in the public eye, where everything that a business leader does can be scrutinized, it goes up on social media, people can write anything they want about you, you see headlines with your name in it. Can you talk a little bit about how have you dealt with this as a leader, where people are constantly scrutinizing and analyzing and picking apart pretty much anything that you do? Uh, has that been a challenge? Clearly, I think the role of a leader has become a lot more 24 hours, seven days a week than uh, historically. And with social media and also just the ability to capture people's uh, reactions, it's one that you've got to be very sensitive to. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I'm a very humble person and also I try and do the right thing on an ongoing basis and also treat people with respect and lead with a genuine aspect of how I feel. And I think uh, I do that day in, day out. And so, you know, yes, you can be critiqued. At the same time, you've got to feel comfortable in your own skin. And if you're doing it in a respectful way and you're also doing it in a way that you're driving the company forward, uh, keeping all stakeholders at the forefront, then you've got to be comfortable. So I, I guess that's a little bit of um, just knowing that you're doing everything that you can and trying not to let all that stuff bother you? I mean, how, how do you do that though? Is that like meditation? Is that just kind of tuning it out? Like, how do you not let that stuff bother you if it's floating around there? You know, Jacob, it's um, something that I've always uh, felt is important to have a balance. And mm -hmm. uh, I will work hard and I'll always try and do the best thing. At the same time, uh, like all other humans, uh, you've got only so much you can do. And that's what I put into perspective as well. Uh, I don't have all the right answers. I don't know everything, uh, but I'll always do the best for the company 
and also have a balance of um, family time and also interpersonal friendships and uh, you know being able to have that balance and at the end of the day you don't uh, live to work you work to live and so it's an aspect of keeping all of those uh, perspectives in mind it's interesting that you mentioned you uh, it sounds like you're comfortable with saying I don't know uh, I interviewed uh, uh, Jeff Immelt on this podcast a couple months ago of course the the former CEO of, of somebody I know well yes 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 exactly and it's funny because we were talking and I said, Jeff, what what was one of the biggest mistakes that you think you made as the CEO of GE? And he thought about that for a little bit and he said, I wish I would have said I don't know more often. And I'm really curious, obviously you were part of this organization for a while. I think you were there for, for 20 years. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like? Because I'm assuming obviously you worked with, uh, with Jeff, with Jack. I mean, so many of these like celebrity, famous business leaders, what what was that like? For me, it was a great learning experience. I got to see uh, great leaders in action and uh, having different skills and being able to learn from them and also understand how they act as mentors and coaches. And both of them in their particular way helped me grow my career and also uh, made me the leader I am today. So I'm very grateful for that. And I think... Uh, Again, as you look at um, leadership, it, it's all about the different skills and being able to adapt to the situation at times. Uh, Jeff was telling me all sorts of funny stories about Jack and how he would respond. And uh, he was telling me about one meeting where they, him and, and somebody else, like uh, I think it was from finance, were going in there to present numbers or like financials. And Jeff was telling me the story about how Jack was screaming and this, this guy was so scared he could not present to Jack and Jeff and Jeff had to take over because the guy was just like a deer in headlights. Uh, and you hear very mixed things, right? About Jack and about Jeff. Um, do any particular stories or situations or events come to mind when you think about working with, with either of them? Well, I can give you uh, a great story that I've told some of my colleagues and also, um, peers relative to Jack, where um, it was the first time I was actually conducting a project for Jack. And it was uh, back in the uh, mid 90s. And it was a project on IT outsourcing. And you can imagine I'm a young 20 year old uh, and nervous as anything meeting this icon of business. And I go into his conference room and he has his corporate staff. So people that are very senior in the organization and I'm sweating profusely because uh, I'm in an arena which is uh, uncomfortable. He sent straight away I was uncomfortable. And so I started presenting and he immediately says, stop, stop. And I'm like, I haven't said anything yet. I couldn't have screwed up that badly. <laughs> and then he says, okay, with a name like Lorenzo and an English accent, you got to explain your story before you even start. So it just broke the ice completely relative to the situation. And that uh, is something that um, I learned uh, at that time. You, you've got to be able to see if people are nervous or you've got to be able to break the ice so as to allow them to shine. Mm. And on the side of Jeff, you know, a, a lot of things have obviously been said about Jeff. I can just mention the experiences that I've had. And, you know, I've been through the downturn of 2008, 2009 financial crisis, uh, leading a G transportation business. And having to call him up and saying, you know, we've lost all of our volume uh, from a locomotive standpoint, we've got to uh, unfortunately restructure the business. And he was very, very supportive and also very much you take what you can control and you do what's right. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's what I'm asking of you, as opposed to trying to control externalities that you don't have uh, a bearing on. You actually mentioned something. Um, so you, you had to call Jeff and basically tell him that you've lost all your volume. You had to restructure the business. Uh, I know a lot of leaders oftentimes struggle with making really, really tough choices like that. Uh, how do you deal with making really tough choices? I mean, do you have a, a framework or a process that you go through? I mean, especially when it comes to people, right? I mean, that's never easy when you have to go to layoffs or you, you, know, you have to look somebody in the eye and tell them they need to leave. It's very, very uncomfortable for a lot of people. How do you 
And I don't want to say how do you learn to do that, but how do you do it in a graceful way? Or how do you become good at that where that you don't destroy the relationship? Jacob, it's never pleasant to have to take tough decisions. And also when it's people involved in restructuring, it's very difficult. At the same time as a leader, you have to be honest and you have to drive the company forward and you have to make sure that the company is going to be there for the longevity of when the cycle comes back and it recovers. And having that transparency and dialogue and not hiding underneath the desk. I remember uh, another uh, mentor of mine said, the worst thing you can do in a crisis is hide in your own office because everybody is confused and the leader needs to be out there and actually giving a direction and giving clarity. And so I've always uh, really approached a crisis as an opportunity to engage in a dialogue, to engage in really building the camaraderie and making tough decisions, but with everybody understanding why they're being made. And in the aspect of my experience at G Transportation, for as bad as the downturn was in 2008, 2009, we ended up having record years afterwards, bringing back all the employees that uh, had to be laid off for a temporary amount of time. So you, you also have the good aspect of you've built a relationship by being honest and being decisive. So you brought up two things there that I think are interesting. One is it sounds like you're saying it's, and a couple CEOs have told me this, it's better to be trusted than it is to be liked. Uh, so don't play the popularity game, but it's far more important for people to understand why you're making that decision and to trust the decisions that you're making as opposed to just getting everybody to like you for whatever reason. Uh, and this, well, first let me stop there and see, is that what you're saying? Yes. I mean, being a leader is not a popularity contest. Being a leader is taking you from one destination to the next and making sure that you're keeping all of the stakeholders alongside you and also supporting them. Yep. Uh, and then the second thing that you mentioned is uh, during times of crisis, don't hide under your desk. A lot of people turn to you for direction and guidance. What happens when, as a leader, people turn to you, but you don't know what the best course of action is, or, or you don't know what to do? Because I think that's sometimes what a lot of leaders struggle with, right? They feel like they need to make something up. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, like, especially during the pandemic, I was talking to some of the CEOs and uh, Steve Bilt, the CEO of Smile Brands, he was telling me that when he was doing it all hands, people were asking him a lot of questions. And finally, he's like, guys, this is my first pandemic. Like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answers to all of these questions, but I promise you during my second pandemic, I'll be better prepared. And he kind of, you know, made a little bit of a, uh, in, in jest, he was talking about it. So what, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, it's managing ambiguity. And I think as a leader, you have to be very comfortable with the aspect of managing ambiguity and not to look flustered. Mm -hmm. And that's what people look to. People don't necessarily expect you to know all the answers. Clearly, the pandemic was something many of us were facing for the first time. And we had to be agile and navigate the pandemic. But if you provide a sense of ease and a sense of just communication and comfort, people will come along and you will solve it as you go along. Uh, I know that uh, I didn't know what to do the first day of the pandemic. Um, do you stop everybody? Do you try and get people to work? And you have to just go through the process. But the worst thing that can happen is you get flustered. Hmm. And then people see that they won't trust you because they don't think you're going to make the right decisions. And so just, uh, again, there's a sequence of events. And whenever I'm faced with ambiguity, I take a moment of time just to steady myself and also say, okay, on a rational approach, how do we look at this? And let's go communicate to the employees. Let's get the right experts in the room. Let's get the information. And then let's make the best decisions with the information we have available. And they may not all be right, but you're making progress and you're continuing down a direction. Hmm. Do you ever beat yourself up if you make a mistake? I would say I don't beat myself up. I pivot quickly and move to the right decision. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose that's a big difference is understanding when a mistake was made and being able to, to quickly change. Yes, and also being uh, transparent to people around you, in particular your uh, 
team that you made a mistake. I mean, everybody is, is human. It's the ability to change, pivot, and go in the right direction. Hmm. One of the things that you mentioned earlier is obviously people turn to leaders for that sense of calm and stability. And I think it's important to call out that that does not imply that you have to have all the answers. Uh, there are a couple of ways that you could probably respond to your team when they come to you for questions. One is you could say, I, I don't know, leave me alone. I, I don't know what's going on. Or you could say, look, that's a great question. These are uncertain times. To be honest, I don't know exactly uh, the best course of action, but don't worry, together we're going to figure it out. And so I love that approach of like being calm and reassuring is you don't have to have all the, like people think those are oftentimes the same thing, but they're not. Uh, you could be calm and also say, I don't know at the same time. Uh, so I think that's a very important point. And I think also, Jacob, they're great coaching moments as well, because to the extent that they are coming in with a question and the uncertainty, you show that you don't necessarily know, but then you turn it around and say, okay, so let's think about this. What do you think we should do? How do you think we should approach it? And actually it becomes a much more constructive dialogue where you're actually learning as well how different people are looking at things. Mm. Yep, mm. also an important skill for sure. Uh, have you ever dealt with imposter syndrome? Uh, so I know this is something a lot of leaders um, whether they're CEOs or maybe mid or entry level leaders. And I, I get this question a lot is sometimes people get into that leadership position and they get that sense of imposter syndrome. Like I don't deserve this. I shouldn't be here. I'm not qualified. Have you ever had those types of thoughts? And if so, how do you deal with them? So I've never had those thoughts. I've worked hard and I've learned, and I've also been open to feedback. And so, I feel comfortable in my own skin that I deserve the position I have. And I think I've been fortunate that I had big leadership roles at a young age, which meant in many situations, I was actually having a team with people that were elder, more established than myself. And so I gained that early on, the aspect of self-confidence and also the confidence to move forward with decisions as well as then also be open to feedback. But the imposter feel, feeling, no. I, I think as a leader, that, uh, that can be actually um, a sign of weakness with regards to people trusting you because you're not self-confident. Have you ever um, experienced somebody on your team or maybe some other leaders going through that? And have you ever had to coach them through, through that process of, of self-doubt? Yes. Uh, and I think, again, when you progress very quickly or you second guess yourself too much and, you know, I think it's uh, an aspect of how you manage ambiguity and also the building of self-confidence. Um, you know, I've made some very um, interesting choices and decisions where, you know, I've made mistakes of uh, new product development that we've launched uh, or a new facility. And, I think sharing those experiences with people helps them also gain the self-confidence. We're all on a leadership journey, yeah. uh, but imposter syndrome, it, it starts to eat away at you and then you're likely not meant to be a leader. So you're talking about a couple of mistakes and I always love to ask uh, leaders this question. Are, are you able to share any of the big mistakes that you've made? Oh, so, um, you know, I. Uh, felt that we knew how to make batteries and uh, invested on uh, a sodium battery plant, which uh, unfortunately didn't go according to plan. Great idea, but uh, wasn't as well executed. Um, in some of the models, I used to be with the appliance business um, and some of the models didn't quite sell off the uh, floor as we'd hoped. So design uh, aspects and those are lessons learned. A lot of them on the commercial side and the uh, product development side. Hey everyone, it's Jacob. Before we get back to the show, just a quick reminder, the future of work requires that leaders put people first. Employee surveys and people analytics from Perceptics can help your organization capture critical feedback about the employee experience and then focus action where it matters most to drive the business forward. Learn more about how you and your organization can do that by visiting perceptics.com forward slash future of work. And again, that is P E R C E P T Y X dot com forward slash future of work. And now back to the show. And so just to give people some context in terms of this, the magnitude of the mistakes, 
you know, sometimes people get upset if they make a mistake that costs, you know, $100 or $1,000. So what was the scale or the magnitude of the mistakes that you made? Are we talking millions of dollars, thousands of dollars? Well, it's all relative, depending on the size of the company. So yeah. I, I'm fortunate that uh, the scale of the company was uh, significantly large. But we're talking in the millions of dollars when, that, when you actually look at some of the mistakes. But you're also looking at wins as well yeah. that go into the hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, I've always said perfection isn't getting everything right all the time. It's when your batting average is above 70%. Hmm. Yeah, and I think it's important... Um... I think sometimes people feel that as a leader, you should not make mistakes or you can't make mistakes. But I, I've never talked to a business leader who hasn't made mistakes. So that's, I always love asking people that question. Uh, no, you learn a lot from your mistakes. You do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always share them. Like I, I play competitive chess and um, I think I was having this conversation a few weeks ago and I always learn the most from the games that I lose as opposed to from the games that I win. Because the games that I lose, you know, if there's a certain move that causes me to get into a bad position, I remember that move. And then next time when something similar comes up on the board, I'm like, I'm not doing that again. Uh, so I, I learn a lot from those losses, far more than, than I do from the wins. And I, I suspect it's true in the business world as well. Very much so. Is there anything... So when you look at yourself as a leader or as an individual... Is there anything that you think that you need to work on or is there anything that you're constantly trying to improve upon or get better at? So over time, my leadership styles changed. And I think that's true with any good leader as they continue to evolve. And I go back to my um, earlier career and I used to be do it all myself, uh, probably not the greatest of leaders in coaching and developing talent around you, but micromanaging and uh, very much command and control. And Interesting. as I've evolved, it's um, much more an aspect of delegation, forming a team, developing the team and trusting the team. And as you move into higher leadership positions, allowing that to flourish and you set the direction. But that's the evolution that I've been on. So the feedback I used to have is you can't do everything by yourself. You gotta develop the team around you. Uh, taking bets on people the way they took on me uh, when I was uh, in my earlier career. And I think that's just the, the development that I've had. Hmm. What caused your evolution as a leader? Because I also hear lots of stories from employees who say, you know what, my leader doesn't evolve. Uh, doesn't evolve. My leader doesn't change. They take the same outdated practices from 20, 30, 40 years ago and apply them today. Did somebody have like a, a sit down with you and say, hey, Lorenzo, like, it's time, you gotta change. Or what, what caused that, that evolution for you? So I think listening skills and also receiving continuous feedback and actually going through a 360 and taking it to heart. I think it's important as a leader that you don't become uh, you know, hard of hearing. And there's people that want to see you be successful and also your team, for the most part, wants you to be successful because it's a reflection upon themselves as well. So that listening skill and then also the aspect of showing vulnerability. And I think uh, a team is much more willing to give you feedback as well when you show vulnerability and the appreciation for the way in which they think you should develop. And look, you're always going to have your strong convictions. You're always going to have uh, uh, to be decisive. But also being vulnerable to feedback and taking that feedback on, I think, helps to evolve you. I just remembered earlier you were talking about self-confidence as well and, and why that's so important. How do you develop that um, for people who are watching or listening? So um, I'm not sure I can say how you develop it. I can tell you the way I've developed it over time. And it's by, first of all, always having something that I can fall back on as an aspect of knowledge base and expertise. And so, hmm. you know, I've got the good fortune of having come up through finance. So I understand finance and also the element of critical thinking. And so I rely on some of my uh, core skills in an aspect of having the confidence. And then also just the journey that I've been on and some of the experiences I've had. I've always um, looked to have different experiences and learn from those and that gives you self-confidence in being able to adapt and be agile in different situations. Hmm. 
Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit. I know we only have uh, 15 minutes or so left here. Um, I know that you've been a big advocate for for a lot of change in the business world, um, change around diversity and inclusion. You're talking about the energy uh, transformation that we're going through. And can you talk about the importance of, as a leader, taking a stance on these things, of, of, of talking about these things, of, of addressing these things? Because I feel like over the years, leaders used to kind of stay quiet and now that there's more spotlight and more scrutiny, people are starting to speak up and, and, and basically take a stance. Can you talk about the importance of doing that, especially when it comes to you know, things like climate change or societal issues? Well, I think it's important for business leaders to stand for something and also to stand for what the company believes in and also what the employees are asking them to believe in. At Baker Hughes, we are an energy technology company and we believe that we can help really reduce the carbon footprint in the globe and provide safe, reliable energy for the people in the planet. And so we have a voice around that. And everything we do from capital allocation to development of people is, is around that. I'll also say I think leaders need to be a voice for the underrepresented and also for the way in which the globe needs to continue to evolve. And that's why diversity, equity and inclusion is so important. Because if we don't say it as leaders, then how will it evolve? And that's uh, the best decisions we know are made when you actually have variation and diversity of thought. And that comes through DEI as well. Yep. Uh, and obviously you're in a pretty interesting space because I think your, your entire business is transforming, right? And can you talk about how do you... How do you lead an organization where it's not just your organization that's transforming, but it's your, your industry, right? I mean, oil and gas moving towards more sustainable energy. We're talking about, you know, electric for so many different types of things. So how do you pivot in such a rapidly changing world and not kind of cling on to the past? Well, there's a saying that is, uh, you know, move fast, change fast be agile and pivot. And I think uh, the speed at which things are changing necessitates that we as leaders actually use that agility. And so we know the end goals, but how you're going to get there can vary day in, day out, and also different roads that you take. And we look at the external world, we look at what's happening, and we pivot accordingly. And so instead of it being one big marathon, it's actually short sprints that get you along that way. And that's the way in which we've been uh, through this journey for the last three years. We came out with our net zero commitment in 2019, uh, saying that by 2030, we'd reduce our own carbon footprint by 50% and by 2050, be at net zero. At that stage, I could never have thought what would happen with the pandemic. And now you have over 60% of the world's GDP committed to net zero in 2021. The speed at which it's changed has been fundamental but we've actually been along that journey and now it's just acceleration of it. Can you actually talk about the impact that COVID had on your business um, and, and what that looked like? So first of all, obviously from a health and safety perspective, our priority was in making sure all of our employees, the contractors and also the communities that we're working in were safe. And that was priority number one. And if you look at our values at Baker Hughes, we have one of our four values being care. And the first aspect was how do we care for each other? And, you know, I saw acts of kindness from, you know, gift packages being sent from China to Italy as the COVID pandemic really transcended the global locations. Then it was secondly, you know, how do we maintain operations as a critical industry and being a critical business to supplying energy? And so the right procedures in place. And I couldn't be prouder of the employees that were out there in the field maintaining operations going. And I'd say the third element, it's one of uh, further acceleration of our strategic pivot towards being energy technology and the focus on climate change and reducing the carbon footprint. So um, all in all, you know, the pandemic, clearly a big focus on people and their health. But then also it's, uh, I think, accelerated the desire and also the discussion around climate change. Did it impact your, your company as a whole as far as 
revenue, profit, things had to shut down? So we didn't have to shut down. We clearly had to uh, take the actions necessary from a right sizing perspective. And uh, we took those. So there was a decline in our activity. And as we look to the rest of 21 and going into 22, we're starting to see that activity come back. So yes, it was a uh, downturn in our industry. And as other cycles have happened before, we'll see the up cycle coming forward. Last uh, maybe question or two here, and I wanted to talk a little bit about culture because you uh, you had to lead the merger between uh, GE Oil and Baker Hughes, which I would imagine are quite different cultures, uh, different ways of working, different values. Can you talk about what the GE Oil culture was like, what the Baker Hughes culture was like, and how did that end up coming together, or, or did it come together in a good way? It definitely came together in a good way, and I'm pleased with where we are today. Uh, it was a roller coaster, though, because uh, we actually went through a, a marriage and then also a separation with General Electric, and they've actually been decreasing their stake in us. At the foundation, the culture between the companies, though, had something that was very appealing and very strong. They were both technology biased and engineering biased. And mm. so they had this strong heritage of being able to be inventive and having the best equipment and reliability. On the commercial side, uh, the GE oil and gas was more commercially inclined and more focused and so had more international reach and more customer interactions. And we were able to bring that to the Baker Hughes element. And on the process side as well, there was more process rigor that we were able to apply. On the Baker Hughes side, the whole caring element and the HSE focus came across to us. So it actually was a good marriage and we're stronger as a company together than we were apart. Hmm. And, and culture wise, would you say that as far as just how those different organizations behaved, what they valued in, was there some synergy there? Definitely synergy. And we went through a process of really identifying the values that would make Baker Hughes. And we converged on four that resonated across all of the employees and leading because uh, we want to be in front of the energy transition, leading with our technology, care because of the HSE aspect and also the aspect of uh, really developing talent and also our employee base and also communities we're in, grow uh, because again, the commercial actions and growing internationally and collaborate. Uh, collaborating across each other and bringing the best to, to the table. So the values resonated well and has actually been a f forcing function of us coming together as a company. Great. Uh, maybe last question for you, um, and that is around any advice that you have for maybe two different groups. One is aspiring leaders, so people who are still early in their careers who are looking to become leaders, um, and any advice that you have for them and maybe current leaders. So people already in a leadership position who want to grow and excel even further. Any advice or suggestions or tips for those groups? So for the uh, both, I would say embrace change. Embrace change, embrace ambiguity. And to the younger leaders, I'd say follow mentors and also take their advice. They're there to champion you. They're there to mentor you. And, you know, a lot of people get hung up early in their career. What's my title? What's the job scope? And at the end of the day, they're all good roles if they come from people that uh, are sponsoring you, championing you and mentoring you and they want to see you develop. So don't uh, don't be too picky. Um, I never uh, selected a job that I was in. It was always uh, offered to me early in my career. And I benefited from it tremendously so, to uh, the more people, senior leader. So one, one question. So are you saying that the people you work for are more important than the job that you're doing? The people that are providing you the support and you're working for are more important than the job itself because they want to see you develop. So okay. The job itself will actually develop you. Uh, don't, don't get hung up about location. Don't get hung up about uh, job title. It's your development that's most important. Got it. And to senior leaders, uh, I would say, including uh, advice that I give myself all the time is, develop the network of other senior leaders 
And when you're in a moment of confusion, have a group of individuals you can speak to that are going through the same confusion and actually, you know, uh, be a member of a business council or be a member of some of these uh, CEO groups or uh, general manager groups where it's much better to share a problem than hold it all to yourself. And you can get a lot of valuable advice from these groups. I love it. Great advice. Have a community of people that you can reach out to. Um, right. Well, we are out of time. Where can people go to learn more about you, uh, your company, anything that you want to mention for people to check out? Well, look, first of all, the company, uh, BakerHughes.com, it's out there. And uh, I appreciate everybody going and looking at the great energy technology that we provide and also the role we play in energy transition. From a personal standpoint, uh, again, don't uh, be shy. If you want to reach out, I am on LinkedIn uh, from a social media perspective. And, That's how we uh, connected. I like engaging. And uh, look, I think it's important that... Uh, these type of uh, discussions take place on leadership and also the future of leadership and the way in which the workplace continues to evolve. So thanks a lot, Jacob, for doing this. My pleasure. Um, and thanks again for sharing all of your insights and ideas. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. Of course. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again, Lorenzo Simonelli, Chairman and CEO of Baker Hughes. And I will see all of you next time. Thanks for tuning into this show. I really do hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to head over to defineleadership.com to grab a copy of my brand new PDF that's gonna walk you through a framework on how to create your own personal definition of leadership and why that matters now more than ever. You will also see the definitions of leadership from some of the CEOs I interviewed, including from the CEOs of organizations like KPMG, Oracle and Verizon. Again, you can get that PDF at defineleadership.com. And of course, I would love it if you subscribe to this YouTube channel for more videos just like this and for interviews with some of the world's top business leaders. Thank you for watching.